So it's 2.30 and it looks like it's time for me to begin this um, this broadcast. I thought until I'm going to put a book underneath my computer. So it's a bit easier for you to see me. got a technical guy sitting there in Dehradun, Ganesham. Uh, I don't know if he started yet or not. I'm asking him what I should do. All right, so hello everyone got this a bit higher so I can talk. I had thought until about five minutes ago I thought I was going to be interviewed, but evidently it's not an interview. It's not an interview, it's a spontaneous talk from me. So I'll let my guy know in Dera Doom. And um, somebody's already said good evening to me. Hey, Melita. Thanks. Good evening to you, too. Yeah, I should talk about how I ended up in Garwal in the first place. I was always interested in the mountains. I liked uh, hiking and tramping and trekking and so forth. So, of course, I was always curious about the Himalayas. And... Um, I had a chance to go to Benares as an undergraduate back in 1977. Before I went to Benares, I read about the Sri Nanda Devi Rajjat, which happens every 12 years. It's the large pilgrimage of Nanda Devi. And I was so fascinated by all of this stuff that I decided I would go and uh, have a look at Rupkund and have a look at the pilgrimage place while I was an undergraduate. And so when I was there in Benares from 1977 until 1979, studying at BHU, studying Hindi, I took every chance that I could to uh, take a trip to the Himalayas. I'd take that train, it's still running, the long train from, I think it's Mughalsarai, does it start in Mughalsarai or in, in Varanasi main station, all the way to Dehradun, and then I would get on a bus. In those days, you had to get yourself to Rishikesh, and then you would take a bus. It took two days to get to Badrinath. It was a very rough trip. I went to Badrinath, Kedarnath, Gangotri, Jamnotri, all of those places. Um, as often as I could, went to Valley of Flowers. And my interest in Nanda Devi took me to the village of Norti, actually to a man called Devram Nortial, who used to call himself the Mahamantri of Nanda Devi. He was interested in... <clears throat> Or he was very much her bhakta, and he organized lots of activities for her, lived in the village of Norti. I went and visited him, and in my broken Hindi, I speak excellent Hindi now, but in those days I was just a beginner. In my broken Hindi, I asked him about the pilgrimage. And he said I should write him a letter in Shud Hindi, and he would answer all of my questions. So I went back to Benares and spent days sweating over this letter to him. And he sent me a 20-page detailed letter about all of the aspects of the Nanda Devi tradition. And that was the beginning of a long tradition. I ended up writing my PhD about Nanda Devi. I dedicated it to Devaram Nortial. Last year in Dehradun, I got the, the Devaram Nortial Loha Parush Award from the people of Norti. <clears throat> it started a very long association with Norti <clears throat> and Today with Devram Sam Bhuvan Nortial, who is running, who is in charge of organizing the Rajjat these days. Um, during this time in India, from 1977 to 1999, I fell in love with India. I absolutely loved everything about it. The people, the food, the history, the literature, all of it. And I decided to become an anthropologist, because as a social anthropologist, it would give me the chance to 
returned to India and to do a kind of research which involved me with Indian people. Um, because I realized originally I'd been interested in the Himalayas, in the mountains, but I very quickly realized, well, a mountain is a mountain is a mountain. Pe all mountains are pretty much similar. But the difference about the Himalayas is there's people living in them, the Pahardis. And it was the experience of the mountain, and I, I, I fell in love with those people as well. So I decided to be an anthropologist so that I could come back and spend as much time as possible in the mountains and with the Pahardi people. So I went and began my PhD in anthropology at what was and still is the best anthropology department in the world in Chicago. And I came back in 1984 and did my research on the goddess Nanda Devi and her Raj Jat pilgrimage. And basically I discovered that in order to understand, th understand this, I needed to know much more than just the goddess and her ritual I needed because she's a she's a village daughter. She's a Dhyani. Uh, she's a Dhyani who lives on Kailash with Shiva and she comes back once a year for the festival. Um, and the uh, when people escort her back to Kailash where she lives with her husband it's a kind of uh, escorting of a dhyani, of a woman, back to her husband's village after the ceremonies. So I realized I had to know about kinship relations, about marriage, about folklore. To understand this, I had to know everything about Pahari life, and especially about um, women's lives in the hills. So that was that research. Um, later on, that research on uh, the Nanda Devi pilgrimage and on the Rajjat ended up uh, with a, a PhD dissertation and a book. We made a film, which is still often shown in India, called um, called Skeleton Lake. And the whole business of Rupkund, the whole controversy about the bones at Rupkund, has come up again recently in the press with some new archaeological discoveries. So that research actually continues over and over, and people are still reading that book. I gave some lectures last year at Harvard University and Columbia University, and I discovered the students at these uh, excellent universities are still reading that book. So that made me that made me happy. A book and a movie, and it continues. Um, after that, I became interested in the Pandav Nritya. Um, just as I was leaving after finishing my PhD research, an old man took me aside and he said, you know, if people really want to understand our traditional culture here in Garhwal, they should work on the Pandav Nritya. Pandav. And I've, I had never heard of it before. I managed to see one performance before I left uh, to go back to the USA. And then I worked up another research proposal. And I came back a few years later, I came back as often as I could and began doing research on Pandav Nritya, or Pandav Leela. Uh, during this research, I met my dear friend um, Dataram Purohit. He's a retired professor from Srinagar University and probably the leading expert in the world on the folklore of Uttarakhand. He and I worked together on some of this material. I wrote a long book about the Pandav Leela um, and the, the performance of Mahabharata, which happens every winter throughout Garhwal, took me to a lot of places. Again, I was deeply involved with folklore, um, just like in the Nanda Devi uh, research. A lot of my material came from folk songs, from performances, from recitations. The wonderful thing about Pandav Leela is how the village men recite long episodes of, Pandal, of Mahabharata by memory and then dance them out. Um, so I was involved with a lot of folklore research during that research too. Got to know Professor Parohit. And that research too continues because Parohit himself has found a very old Uttarakhand version of Mahabharata. This is a long, long oral epic. A couple of uh, old men up near um, Tilwara in the Mandakini Valley had recited this thing. I think it's 80 hours long, very, very long. It's perhaps the o longest oral version of Mahabharata in India. And he and I and another colleague are slowly working through a translation of this. 
we want to translate it into uh, we want to transcribe it in the Pahardi language and then translate it into Hindi and English. It's a very long work, it'll take us a few years, but we started on that and it's just another example of how this research on Mahabharata continues and keeps developing in new directions. The research I did after that was on the healing cult of Bhairava. Uh, there's a particular form of Bhairava in Chamoli district, uh, a very fierce form of the god Bhairava, Katya Bhairav, who is associated with some of the local Dalit castes. And my research on that was about this particular, again, a lot of folklore, a lot of songs, a lot of rituals. And I realized that many of the songs that are sung about Katya Bhairav have to do with some of the terrible things that have been experienced by the Dalit community in the years before uh, this kind of caste uh, uh, oppression was made illegal, some terrible things happened. And the rituals and the songs are collective memories of the, of the things that happened and very powerful memories. So in this particular cult, there's a lot of um, dancing and singing and memories of these things in the past, uh, and a lot of healing as well. So my research took me into the direction of ritual healing, healing not only of physical ills, but of psychological ills, of difficulties within the family, of difficulties that people have in their lives and, and their family situations, which often make them very ill or dysfunctional somehow. And what I discovered in there was really interesting that all of the rituals surrounding the cult of Bhairav and especially Katya Bhairav, what they try to do is bring people together. If there's been a quarrel, if there's been a misunderstanding, if there's been some difficulty, often in the past, often two or even three generations in the past, this is never entirely forgotten by the family. And when they go to see the oracle, the uh, Pujwardi, the Baki, uh, he or she may tell them that the problem they are experiencing, the bad health, the bad luck, whatever, goes back two or three generations to a quarrel that happened within the family, which was never really resolved. And in the course of this ritual, people come together. P their relatives come from Delhi, they come from Dehradun. Somebody brings the wood, somebody cooks the food, somebody prepares the ritual place, someone builds the shrine. Everyone has their task and they work together. And my thesis in the book was that the, the religious ritual serves to bring people together, to overcome their quarrels, to recognize the, the unresolved conflicts within the family, and to work together. And when they work together, then often the particular difficulty that's happening, the illness or the sickness, is healed. And uh, there are some European traditions of psychotherapy which are remarkably similar to this. I've written about that as well. And so that research continues as well, the research into ritual healing, the use of religion, prayer, ritual, and so forth, to heal people's physical and mental illness. And I've done more research on that amongst Muslims, actually in the UK. I worked with some Muslims living there because they speak Urdu, and I speak Hindi and Urdu myself, so I spent quite a bit of time working on ritual healing among them. Uh, I'm also interested in ritual healing amongst the Hindus of Bali in Indonesia. So that's another topic. It keeps growing and, and, and increasing. Just at this very moment, I'm writing my most recent book about the most recent research, which happens in the part of Uttarakhand, which borders on Himachal Pradesh, that is Romai, near, uh, near Tuni, uh, Purola, Mori, these places. And as most of you know, when you cross into the uh, Jamuna River Basin, when you cross over the Jamuna River, then you're in a really different culture area. Back in the old days, when I did my research in the 70s, all the Pahardis wore a particular old-fashioned Pahardi hat. I think I have one here somewhere in my office. These days, everyone is wearing the round hats, Back in the 70s, the round hats were only worn by people from Himachal and from those who lived in the Jamuna Basin. So the language is slightly different, their culture is slightly different, their clothing is slightly different, and in the areas where I've been working, um, 
which is in the Tons River Basin above Mori. Uh, they have a fantastic, very, very rich folk culture, rich folklore, dancing, a uh, lot of music, and a fascinating culture. Uh, I am focusing on Karana, uh, who is called the Raja Karan. He is conceived of as the king of a particular area. Uh, his mulk, which focuses around Siktur Pati. Uh, I've worked in that area now for 20 years, and I've been doing a lot of research on the religious rituals associated with Karan, Dani Raja Karan. Uh, and so I'm right in the middle of writing that book as well, and it's a, it's a fascinating area. I'm looking here to the left at my screen. If anyone has questions about any of this research, you can do it. I see uh, Mr. Bandari is thanking me for educating you about your ancestral traditions, it's, and, and he congratulates me. Yeah, it's funny that this American guy should be uh, telling the Pahardis about their own traditions, but... I've really worked hard at it. It's been now almost 40 years I've been coming to India, and most of those 40 years have been in uh, spent in Uttarakhand. So I absolutely love Uttarakhand. I've always told my friends that uh, I would like to become a foreign minister. <laughs> but let's see what happens. I'll certainly be coming back for a long time. Anyway, if any of you have questions, feel free to ask them. I had talked to Lokesh Ori earlier about this program, and he'd we'd talk about some things that could be considered. One of them is pilgrimage. Um, during the 70s, when I first came to Uttarakhand, as I said, I went to a lot of these pilgrimage places, Badri Kedar, Jamnotri, Gangotri, and so forth. Um, and when I first went there, the old pilgrimage paths were still in use. The old, um, the old places where people would stop along the way, the Parao. And I saw, and as I said, it took so long, it took at least two days to get from Dehradun to Badrinath. The road was often washed out. The roads were much, much worse than they are today. There's no comparison. Zameen asman ka farak Usi zamai ke jo rasti te aur aaj kal ke. They're completely, completely different. And uh, when you'd go through places like Kalyasord <clears throat> on the public transportation, you were really taking your life into your hands. So it was very primitive. It took a long time to get there. And um, now, of course, it's very different. And tourism or pilgrimage has really radically changed. And the phenomenon of the pilgrim tourist who sits in a comfortable bus and maybe watches a Hindu, Hin, Hindi movie on the way up to Badrinath and stays in a sort of world-class hotel, uh, this has hap This is more and more typical of pilgrimage to that area. And I sort of have the feeling, well, if a religious pilgrimage should involve tapasya. It should be difficult. You're not supposed to be comfortable. You're not supposed to enjoy yourself. You're not supposed to be having uh, five-star meals in a fancy hotel. You're supposed to rough it. And through roughing it, you uh, engage in this tapasya and you earn some kind of phal, some kind of punya. Um, but those old days when people used to walk for weeks and even months up into the hills have kind of vanished. Of course, you find a few pilgrims like that. And when you go to places like the Panch Kedar, I've been on the Panch Kedar Yatra oh, two or three times. That is the five mountaintop temples of Shiva, of which Kedarnath is only one. When you go to such places, then you really do find uh, sincere pilgrims who are doing difficult journeys. And of course, you find Bengali trekking clubs as well. Um, and what's going to happen now in the future? I wonder. I hope that pilgrimage in Uttarakhand might transform itself a little bit and that people might be able to capture some of the original spirit of pilgrimage, which had to do with really hard conditions with tapasya, and that people might start walking again. If people were able to walk on those old paths, it would be great for local industry. You wouldn't be polluting the environment. You wouldn't be burning so many petrol fuels. You would be supporting local farmers and local people who would have their little shops and, and places to eat and 
places to stay overnight. The dharamshala is on the way up. You would ta have to take the time to reflect and to do your puja and your meditation properly every day. I think that would be really interesting if people would, were, if this form of pilgrimage would um, would uh, could take place. I'm reading some messages now. Uh, I see Lokesh has asked me a question about Karan. There's another question about Karan too. Let me go to those. Uh, Lokesh asks why people would worship heroes and anti-heroes. I mean, Karan is one of the Kauravas, right? Why would people worship him? Someone else asks if the temple, Sargam Mehra asks if temple at Karna follows traditions similar to mainstream deities. Um, well, don't forget, Karan, Karan is, there weren't five Pandava brothers, there were six. And Karna was not only the sixth, but he was the oldest. He was older than Arjuna. Uh, and he was, he's not called Dani Raja for nothing. He was a very, very virtuous person. In fact, he only really made one mistake in his life, which was that um, during the um, during the court scene, he kept quiet while they were uh, humiliating Draupadi. He didn't say anything. He kept his mouth shut. That's about the only bad thing he ever did. And for the rest of his life, every act he took and every word he spoke was absolutely virtuous. And what he's particularly known for is his generosity, which is why he's called Dani Raja. So in the temple at uh, Natwar, near Natwar, it's actually in the village of Diora, above old Natwar, he's worshipped, and he is the king of that entire region, not only Natwar, but um, um, all the way up to um, uh, uh, Sima, what's the name of the town where the pilgrimages start, for quite a large region, he is the king, and he's worshipped. And truly, when he moves around on his palaki, as many of the local devatas do, he doesn't demand anything from people. He doesn't demand food. He doesn't demand uh, part of their uh, harvest, as some of the other local gods do. He gives. He's Dani Raja. He goes and he gives things away. So his generosity, his charity is known. So he's not, and so he's between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. You remember it was Karna. It was Duryodhana who made Karna a king. He made him the king of um, of some South Indian kingdoms, um, Anga and Vanga, I think they were called, during the competition with Arjuna at the Swayambara. There was a tournament. It wasn't the Swayambara. It was a tournament that was organized. And he was told that he Krishna saw him coming. He realized that if Karna participated, he might defeat Arjuna. So he stood up and said, don't let him participate. He's only the son of a chari charioteer. So Krishna was engaging in a bit of casteism there. He's only the son of a charioteer. He shouldn't be allowed to compete. And it was Duryodhana who, in that very moment, crowned him the king of Anga and Vanga, thus allowing him to participate. Um, and therefore, because he had uh, eaten the salt, na, Duryodhana namak kayata was samai. But Islie, he uh, was loyal. And this is one of his virtues. He was always very loyal to Duryodhana. And so he stuck in between of them. He's part Pandava and part Kaurava. Uh, I should be careful. I could go on and on about this theme since it's my current book. Um, there's a division in that part of Uttarakhand between the Shati and the Pancha. That is the Kauravas and the Pandavas. The Kauravas are called the Shati because it's believed that there were not a hundred Kauravas, there were 60 Sarta. Therefore, the Kaurava party are called the Sartis and the Pandava party are called the Pansya. And Karna's temple is right at the border where the Shatis who live upstream meet the Pansyas who live downstream. So he's very much a figure who is in both camps. Do his uh, rituals resemble mainstream Hindu rituals? Yes, uh, very much so. Um, of course, there are local uh, differences, but basically he's uh, it follows. Are there, The question, this is Sargam Mehra, also asks if any festival or celebration to celebrate in the Ravai marks an event in his life. Mm, no, not really. There are 
important local festivals, but they have more to do with the, with the lunar solar calendar of Uttarakhand and not with Karna's life. Um, a couple of people ask me if I can suggest texts in English. Best to write me an email. Send me an e email to Dehradun and I can tell you about that. Um, so I'm writing about that too and I'm finding, uh, again, the great fascination of folklore because a lot of what I've done relates to the old folklore. Now I've run out of questions. Ask me some questions. Lokesh asked me why, why worship heroes and anti-heroes. If you ask local people, they will tell you these are our ancestors. And this is a, an important thing about not only, Ut mostly Uttarakhand, let's say the Western Himalayas, a bit less in Kumaon, but particularly in Garhwal, that people believe that the Pandavas are their ancestors. So the word for the Pandav Nritya is often Ganda. What does it mean to do a Ganda? Ganda means rhinoceros. What is that? It's a bit of a long story. But the idea is that after the, the, the Rajasu, in the Mahabharata, the Rajasuya Yagya was never completed. It wasn't completed, and in the meantime, Raja Pandu died. And his um, funeral rituals, his Shrad, was never completed. So often people will say, they don't say, Ki Pandav Lila Hone Wala Hai, Ya Phalane Gaume Pandav Nritya Hoga, Lekin will get the hai, Ki Phalane Jaga Ek Shrad Hoga, Ya Me Shrad Dekne Jaunga. Shrad means they're doing the Shradha, the funeral ritual, of Pandu. And how do you do the funeral rituals? You enact the Mahabharata, you enact the story. So the performance itself is thought of as a kind of ritual, a Shrad ritual for a Pandu. Or it's called a Ganda. Then it gets even more complicated because normally um, when uh, Pandit does the Shrad ritual, he wears that particular ring. I think it's Kusar grass. He wears the ring of Kusar grass. That's an important ritual element. And in this story, the, they need a rhinoceros hide because they need to use the rhinoceros skin to make a ring for the pundit to wear during the Shraddha ritual. And you hear this and you think, this is crazy. What a, what a backwards custom these Bahardis must have had. But no, no, it's not backwards at all. If you look in the Manava Dharma Shastra, you find that rhinoceros hide rings were indeed recommended in the ancient Dharma Shastras. So the Bahardis have obviously kept that tradition. And the story, it's a bit too long and complicated, but the story has to do with Arjuna's son, Nagarjuna, who is called uh, Babruahana in the Sanskrit versions of the epic. Nagarjuna goes in search of the rhinoceros. He shoots the rhinoceros so that he can make a ring and so that the Sharad of Pandu can be done. The point is that the Rajputs of Garhwal believe that the, they are descended directly from the Pandavas and therefore the performance of Pandav Leela is a kind of funeral ritual. Similarly, in Ravai, where they identify with the Kauravas, and where, by the way, they do Pandav Leelas there, but he's not, in, he's not, Karna is allowed, Doryodhana is allowed, but uh, Dharmaraja is not welcome in those valleys because they are the Shatis, they are the Kaurava party. But they too believe they're descended from the Kauravas, and therefore these rituals are a kind of ancestral ritual. Um, and in fact, uh, yeah, rhinoceroses were also, um, Lokesh asks me if there were rhinoceroses. They were. I was giving a public lecture once in, um, I was giving a public lecture in Srinagar at the university, and one of the colleagues stood up and challenged me. He said, Sachs, this is all nonsense what you're saying. We never had any rhinoceroses here in Garhwal. Actually, you did. There are some old um, Rajput miniature paintings from the Mughal period, which show one of the emperors, I forget who it was, Jahangir or Shah Jahan, one of those emperors, hunting rhinoceroses in the forests of the Tarai. Uh, so there were rhinoceroses at one point, but they're gone now. I'm not getting any further questions. So um, what I was saying earlier was about the transformation of tourism. In a way, tourism 
is important for business. Uh, one understands that. So a lot of the tax revenue and the uh, government revenue for the state of Uttarakhand comes from the pilgrimage of, at these places. And that's a good thing, and one doesn't want to cut that down. But one also, the, the more important thing are people's religious experience. And I would love to see a kind of development where, in order to protect the pilgrimages, places like Badrinath and Kedarnath, to protect them from pollution, to protect them from environmental damage, from too many highways and too many hotels and too many petrol stations and all the rubbish that people throw around, to make these places pure again and holy again, it would be really wonderful if there was less uh, uh, bus-based or, say, petrol-based pilgrimage and people would start going by foot. Now, I don't know. It's going to be difficult for people in the modern day and age to go from Dehradun to do the four dhams all by foot. It takes three months or so. But at least people could start their footpath from, say, Joshimat and walk the rest of the way to Badrinath. Or they could start their foot journey from um, from Guptakashi and walk the west, rest of the way to Gedanath. I did that myself, by the way, twice. I walked up with the Murti. When the Murti is brought uh, every spring from Ukimat back up to the temple and installed, I went along with the Murti. It was quite a wonderful experience for me. It was one of the best uh, uh, spiritual experiences of my life. So I would think it would be wonderful if we could have some development in that direction. Less petrol, less pollution, less five-star uh, meals. You know, you might have to do a dal chapati for a few days instead of some, instead of your um, vegetable jalfrezi. But I think it is more in keeping with the spiritual atmosphere of these places. Um, One interesting thing that was I'm also asked about the about the um, the tradition of Nanda Devi, the Nanda Devi Parampara. This is a really interesting thing because Nanda Devi is perhaps one of the strongest symbols for unifying Garhwal and Kumal, because Nanda Devi was also the uh, Ishta Devi of the kings of Kumal, the Chand dynasty. And she was the Ishta Devi of the Pawa dynasty of Garhwal. In fact, if you read my book, you'll find about how sometimes uh, when the Garhwal and Kumaon, of course, were engaged in continual warfare, and in so at the end of some of these wars, they would steal the Murti of the others. The Kumaonis would defeat Garhwalis, and they would, they would bring the Murti of Nanda Devi back to Almora and promise that they would worship her with more splendor and so forth than the Garhwalis would. And then a few years later, the Garhwalis would do the same thing. So, and even the battle cry of the Kumanis was Jai Nanda Devi Ki. So, this is one thing that unites both of the regions. And when the big jot happened in the year 2000, in the very year that uh, the state of Uttarakhand was created, in that very year, the Kumanis came for the first time in many years, uh, a delegation from Kuman, and they joined in the Rajdat pilgrimage. And I think that was year in the same year in the Republic Day presentation. There was a fantastic um, a float, one of these floats that I don't know what you call it in Hindi, where you uh, kind of vahana that is carried down the street in Delhi. This vahana was a picture of Nanda Devi with the four horned ram and a kind of representation of the pilgrimage. So there too, it was a great symbol of the cultural unity of. Uh, Garhwal and Kumaon, and she remains that way. Send me your questions. I've run out of things to say. I see there are no more questions, and I've run out of notes. I'll just conclude then by saying um, Uttarakhand has so many advantages. 
the health statistics are very good compared to the rest of India. The, the uh, inequalities of caste and gender are there, of course, like they are in the rest of India and in the rest of the world, but much less, much less than other places. The diet, people eat a lot of what we call bio food or sort of green food, healthy, uh, natural food. They eat much more of it in Uttarakhand than in the rest of India. Um, so for your physical health and your mental health, for the social health, it's a wonderful place and it has many advantages. And I'm always a bit distressed when I see younger people trying to imitate the customs and the diet and the clothing of the plains. Because it, in most cases, it's better in Uttarakhand. It's just better. People are healthier. They are happier. They are more polite to each other, more considerate of each other. They act more ethically with each other. And I think it's really important. I would encourage people in Uttarakhand to be aware of that, to keep their, mm, to, to, to value their old traditions, to expand them, uh, to respect them, and, uh, uh, and in that way to build a better society and to set an example, not only for other people in India, for other people elsewhere in the world. Uh, I think that would be a really good future for Uttarakhand. And with that, I thank you for watching. And I'm going to reach over and turn off the video. Bye.